Everyone has a game, one they can come to whenever they feel stressed or hurt. A game that soothes the soul and tells them that everything's gonna be okay. A game that's been there for them at their greatest time of need and lets them forget their worries. Almost everyone has a game like this, and for me that game is The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. On this channel though, I've barely mentioned it despite my love for it, mostly because of how I couldn't record it because at the time I no longer had the N64 version, I only had the 3DS version, and DS capture units and 3DS capture units are impossible to find. Now that I've finally gotten my hands on an N64 copy though, and I once again need healing in this hard time of my life, let's play it again. But instead of making one super long game review, I'll be making videos about each major chapter of the game. Because while I know a large number of you subbed to me through me uploading the Astral Observatory theme, I still don't know how many of you would actually view a full hour long video about everything. So I'll make around two or three of these videos, and if you guys don't want them, I'll stop. But if you guys do like them, I'll try to post a new one every week. So, let's start from the beginning and look at one of the most infamous opening hours in gaming. The first three day cycle of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Right from the start, the tone of the whole adventure is set in just a few seconds, with a spin of the mask <laughs> in that evil laugh, followed by an opening demo, because every game from this era has one of these before the title screen. This too gives the player an impression of what's to come. Happy music plays for a while, before it suddenly becomes more serious, and we see, for the first time, the most iconic and terrifying moon in the history of media. The start of the actual game itself is perfect, with only text, a black background, and no sounds. It tells a newcomer everything they need to know about Link. He's a hero. A hero that left everything behind. A hero looking for a lost friend. Then, we finally get to see Link for the first time. Most likely being a young teen by now, since he's able to ride a Pona. He's traveled far from Hyrule, looking for the only one who would remember all he did. It's a foggy, gloomy morning for a young boy, but it's about to get a lot worse. A Skull Kid wearing a mysterious mask along with two fairies ambush Link, take his horse and his ocarina, but he wakes up and pursues them, not knowing what he's truly dealing with. What happens next is something I never quite understood. Link falls down this deep, giant hole, and while he falls, there's all sorts of weird things going on. And this has created all sorts of wacky theories, which I'll probably talk about someday. When the Hero of Time finally catches up with Skull Kid, he gets cursed, transforming him into a Deku Scrub. This has to be Link's lowest point in life. He's been through so much. No one in this timeline knows of his heroic deeds. He's had very few people that close to him, and all of them are either dead in the adult timeline or in the Sage's Chamber. Nabi abandoned him, and now, he's not even human. If I was him, at this point, I'd probably just give up on life and become an alcoholic. But not Link. Despite all of this, he continues on, while bonding with one of Skull Kid's fairies, who got left behind, Tattle. There's a short stretch of Cavern Beyond, which gives the player some time to get used to the controls and physics before the time cycle starts. More on that later. Somehow, though, this cavern forest, whatever, leads to a clock tower, with one of my favorite songs of all time playing. Although there doesn't appear to be anyone else with you, as soon as you try to leave, we get another creepy laugh, and one of the most iconic lines in Zelda. You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Okay, I admit, I've kind of overused this line in my videos. It's uncanny, yet oddly poetic. The guy who says it, the Happy Mask Salesman, is even more interesting, as well as creepy. Most games have this individual that knows the player's goals. Think Professor E. Gad, or the King of Red Lions, or the Star Spirits, or Rosalina. Nonetheless, what sets the Happy Mask Salesman apart is how he's not quite a good guy. Sure, he wants to help Link return to his original form and stop Skull Kid, but he wants to keep Majora's Mask for himself. A mask with supernatural powers that influences Skull Kid's actions. However creepy the Happy Mask Salesman might be though, the guy's at least willing to cut a deal. If Link gets the mask back and a stolen ocarina, he'll teach him how to return to his previous self, 
That is, if he can get it back in three days, because the mask salesman has to travel away by then, leaving Link 72 hours to get all of this done. Okay, finally, on to the actual topic of the video, the first three day cycle. I love this part of the game. Nevertheless, I understand how frustrating it can be for people playing this game for the first time. For one, there is no way to save it all during this chapter, forcing the player to do it all in one sitting. Additionally, there's a time limit and a number of things that need to get done in the three days, which adds up to 54 minutes in real time, or else it's back to the beginning. All this sounds pretty difficult. In reality though, if you know what you're doing, it's a breeze. Here, I'll sum it up in 9 steps. Step 1. Go to the laundry pool and collect a stray fairy. Step 2. Go to the fairy's fountain to restore the great fairy who bestows snot powers on Link. Step 3. With these new snot powers, pop this balloon which gets the attention of Jim, the leader of an organization of kids known as the Bombers. Step 4. Play a hide and seek minigame with the kids and it tell you a password through the Astro Observatory. Step 5. Enter the observatory. Step 6. Look for the telescope at the clock tower and Skull Kid shakes his butt and the moon cries. Step 7. Go outside and collect the tear. Step 8. Give it to this business scrub in exchange for a deed to his land, which is just a flower. Step 9. Use the flower to shoot up to the top of the clock tower. Sounds like a lot, yet is incredibly easy to do. There's plenty of time to do all of this. In fact, I managed to do almost all of it on the first day while screwing around quite a bit. Plus, you get a lot of hints from Tattle to the point of annoyance. Again, I understand people's frustrations with this first section, especially since there's no way to save. Even so, too many people over-exaggerate how hard this prologue is. Completing it is doable, and the time you get is generous. So generous that even as a preteen, I ran out of stuff to do before the eve of the carnival on the final day. What I usually do to pass the time is I walk around Clock Town and look at characters that matter later in the story, but for the time being, you really can't do much with. Like this depressed lady with an umbrella sitting by the laundry pool, or the postman, or this bald guy playing the Song of Storms. A few small side quests can be done as well, such as the Deku Playground, which I failed on. And then there's my personal favorite. If you go to the toilet in the stockpot inn at night, a hand comes out of the toilet, needing paper to wipe with. What Link chooses to give him is the deed he got from the Yay! business scrub. He gives a piece of heart from the toilet. Truly awesome. Wait, I feel like I forgot something kind of important. Oh yeah, the freaking moon is falling from the sky and will destroy the world by the end of the third day. The paranoia everyone in Clock Town feels about the impending doom is actually kind of realistic. Some people deny anything will happen, while others see the danger and are incredibly stressed, scared, or breaking down. That's pretty much everything though about these first three days. A bit stressful for first timers with the whole no saving thing, while on the other hand, it gives an incredible sense of foreshadowing, mood setting, and immersion. Anyway, with all that done, on to the eve of the carnival. At midnight, the entrance to the top of the clock tower opens up, leading the Skull Kid alongside Tattle's brother, Tail, being abused by him. The moon finally starts to fall rapidly, with Snot being the only way to save the day. Link gets his ocarina back, remembering his times with Zelda. This scene here gives me a feel that's rare to see for the rest of the story. It's calm, simple, and it reminds you of the simpler days of Ocarina of Time, where everyone's lives would suck if Ganondorf won, but at least everyone would still be alive. Most of all, he remembers the Song of Time is somehow able to get these bagpipes out of nowhere and plays the song.